you. It is a, um, a real privilege to be here. It's, um, certainly thank Angus and uh, Richard and the, the whole organising committee for the uh, invitation to come up. It's uh, great to have an excuse after 10 years to actually go and spend five days up at Noonbar. And it's the uh, first time in the Channel Country and I think it's uh, certainly been very illuminating to see some of the rivers go from you know, really low and then just go zoom up two metres in uh, just over a day. So. Um, what I want to try and do is use some of the knowledge I have and, you know, um, Angus will be very disciplined. He won't let me go beyond 20 minutes. So in 20 minutes or so, try and cover some of the uh, examples out there. Some are inside the LAB, um, some are just outside the LAB, but some of the projects are actually very relevant for what's coming in the LAB or potentially could be coming. So um, now I thought I'd chuck this in because a lot of us last night were, were down on the Thompson um, and we saw this nice sort of cloud with beautiful sunset colours and the reds and purples there. And in some ways, that's the sort of system we're trying to protect. <coughs> so I think it was a beautiful thing. It was actually a um, very um, timely reminder. And in some ways, everything we've talked about so far is encapsulated in this uh, cartoon. You know, um, we've got sustainable cities, we've got uh, you know, sustainability, we've got you know, rainforests, a whole bunch of things. And, you know, um, there's always someone who says, but what if it's a hoax and we make a better world for nothing? Well, isn't the whole point of actually everything we're talking about here to make a better world, you know, and stuff. So uh, I don't want to see mistakes that we've made elsewhere in Australia be repeated in the LEB, you know, and that's why I'm here. That's why I keep doing a lot of what I do. Um, sometimes that upsets people from industry because uh, there is always a positive side to things and that's fine, there is, but we often don't have a realistic debate about the negative side. And I'd much rather be accused of being honest about the negative side rather than being dishonest about the positive side. So what I want to try and do is mining in the environment. And people here have, have seen some of those sites. Um, we've all heard about some of them. Um, there's probably many we haven't heard. Um, all right, so I'll quickly go through where, where some of the current mining issues are around the LAB or just near the LAB because there's that intersection either with transport and so on. And then I'll go through a bunch of case studies. Uh, and they're all important for their own reasons, and we'll see why. Now, one of the things that we've sort of, the, and again, it's this elephant in the room sort of thing, but um, not only in Australia, we use resources. We've got a projector up the top there. I've got, you know, there's some carbon materials. There'd be lots of metals and stuff that make this electronics work, including the batteries. There's a lot of resources we need on a daily basis, including the steel to make the cars that we drive across the LAB with. That's fine. What we need to decide as a, as a community, as a society, and as a, especially as a global community, is how to do that without costing communities in the planet. But if you look at the last 100, 150, 200 years, of course, we've got that endless growth in production and consumption. And that doesn't show any sign of abating. And for some things, that's fine, like copper, maybe iron ore. For some things, I can see the sort of the black line in here that goes up there, nice exponential curve for coal. And that's exactly a greenhouse line. It's exactly um, mirroring all the things we're seeing in climate change and the rise of uh, things like CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and some of those things we might say that at some point, actually, yes, it's a time for a transition point and we get out of that. And that's fine. We've done that before with asbestos, with uh, a whole bunch of things. It's not an impossible thing to conceive of. But that's a choice we have to make. Do we keep digging and drilling or do we actually look at other, other industries and things? So, but globally, this is what's driving the resources boom, you know, and so it's this sort of demand that's uh, certainly there. There's, you know, lots more stories in that, but, you know, I don't have time. But I wanted to put this quote up because we often think about this debate of mining as being a new thing. It's something that we've really only started to understand the environmental side of mining in the last 30 years. And that's actually wrong. I was actually quite stunned when I was at a uranium conference and someone from uh, ANSTO, or the Australian Nuclear Science and Technolo Technology Organisation, actually put up this quote much smaller part of it, but Agricola is widely considered to be the father of the modern mining industry. In 1556, just literally after he died, his book was published, De Re Metallica, and it was the first book documenting modern mining. Smelting, mining, alluvial mining, underground mining, everything. But the first chapter is the debate about mining, the philosophy of mining. What's the values? What's the impacts? And you can go through a lot of these things, and some of these we've got good examples of in Australia, and we're still repeating these same mistakes. We've got poison waters. We heard about that from Colin, uh, of course, with the Lady Annie. All right. But some people say, actually, there's greater impacts than value. 
We might use triple bottom line language now, and I, you know, I certainly have the same sustainability model as Angus. We have no sustainable planet, we have no community. With no community, we have no economy. And for people who are wondering, my parents were accountants, and I still manage to think like that. So in that way, a lot of these sorts of issues are quite common to you know, mining. We've got, um, it does provide a lot of resources we use, and a lot of those resources are gonna to continue to grow. Certainly for myself, the look at um, some aspects of mining, like say rare earths, they always come with uranium and thorium, often very rich in thorium, and so there's radioactive waste that has to be dealt with in terms of the production of rare earths. There'd be some rare earths in the projectors here, there'd be some rare earths in an iPhone. Um, rare earths make wind turbines better, they make hybrid cars you know, work better. They're fine, I've got no problem with mining rare earths, but we don't need to mine uranium, I think. All right, so there's a lot of resources that we, we can choose to mine, and hopefully we can choose to mine it well, um, sometimes I'm yet to be convinced that that's happened, but um, a whole bunch of things. One of the problems that uh, I realized many, many years ago, and I think it's a big strategic problem that's still being underestimated, is the sheer volume of mine waste. Now, I've been building data sets and trying to track this sort of stuff for years now, um, and it's billions of tons, and that's just not you know, in total. I'm talking billions of tons in Australia per year and growing exponentially, along with our production graph. Translate that figure globally and we're dealing with something that's tens and tens of billions of tons. It's not just simple soil or dirt, we're dealing with stuff that's got heavy metals, radioactivity, sulphides, and when that reacts, of course, we get acid mine drainage. Some of those heavy metals may blow off in dust and actually get into rainwater tanks, and there's been cases of that. Um, and that's still an ongoing issue in places like Kalgoorlie, the Hunter Valley, and so on. So what we really need is to make sure that we monitor holistically, we look at the whole system, and sure, if we're looking at a system like the Lake Air Basin, we need to look at you know, agricultural use of water, the environment's use of water, the cultural values and uses of water, tourism, all of these things together, and if there is mining as well. We can't separate one from the other. We need to manage the whole system. So that's the challenge. So if we look at the Lake Air Basin, uh, a lot of the Lake Air Basin, it's a very large sedimentary basin that's uh, you know, underpinned in most part by the Great Artesian Basin. Um, there are some big projects, um, Olympic Dam or Roxby Downs, of course, was, um, is still one of the biggest projects on the cards. It's a, a super giant deposit, and I don't say that because I want to, I say that because that's the evidence, that's the data. It's amongst one of the most valuable deposits in the world, and that's just based on the copper, uranium, gold, and silver, and ignoring the fact it's also got the biggest deposit of rare earths, which are not being extracted. Um, other things that we've got include oil and gas, so we've got the traditional conventional gas, like Moomba, Aramanga, um, We've also got the move potentially into coal seam gas. Some of those are in areas up in the sort of closer to the um, recharge zone to the Great Artesian Basin. Um, but as we've heard recently, a few weeks ago, of course, there's some companies trying to promote things like shale oil or shale gas or potentially even underground coal gasification, which is something that I hope we really never get done, go down the path of in Australia. Um, so some of those projects are either directly in the LEB or just outside it, but of course that intersection of transport, or infrastructure, all of that. And within all of that, of course, we have the GAB, the Great Artesian Basin Issues, which underpins that. So um, if we look at this as an older map now, but it's still pretty much what we're talking about. So the little dashed lines, of course, is the Great Artesian Basin, which is, um, was my first introduction to a lot of these areas. And when I first went to Lake Eyre, it was to look at the springs. Um, and you realize this intersection of this amazing surface water system, which is the Lake Eyre Basin and the Great Artesian Basin. That's what we've got to be able to manage. You know, this is just a, a snapshot. You can go into the Australian Mines Atlas online. It's provided by Geoscience Australia. Turn on all historic mines, current mines, and future deposits. And you can see there are many parts of Australia that we've had mining, and that a lot of that's been non-controversial. There's some like uranium, and increasingly things like coal and coal seam gas are controversial and will remain so. Um, right, but this area in the middle here, and that's largely because most of the geology that we're dealing with the Lake Air Basin is sedimentary. That suits things like oil and gas, so we've got um, sort of Moomba in the middle here, um, and then around the edges you've got some of the um, provinces like Mount Isa, some gold up around here, and the odd thing elsewhere. So, of course, whether that changes or not is another thing. Now, one of the projects, when I first started looking at the science of all of these things, um, when I first got involved many, many years ago in the late 1990s, um, was the old Mary Kathleen uranium mine. Halfway, roughly, between Concurry and Mount Isa. Um, these days, we'd call it a pretty small mine, but back in the 50s and 60s, and even in the 70s, it was very important. 
was considered a you know a nation building exercise. Um, they exported close to 9,000 tonnes of uranium. Um, these days, that would be a couple of years production out of the range of uranium mine. But they closed it in 86 finally, uh, and they rehabilitated it. Now, when they did that, uh, that rehabilitation was considered to be so good that it won a National Engineering Excellence Award. So the en Engineers Australia, or the Institution of Engineers Australia, um, gave it that award because these are the sort of assumptions that they thought were pretty good at the time. The tailing stand, which was covered over with soil, um, there would be minimal seepage from that tailing stam. There'd be no uptake of radionuclides and heavy metals into the into um, vegetation, so there'd be no um, grazing risk, so therefore you could return that property to some sort of productive use. There'd be no acid mine drainage. That's just a fancy term that we engineers use for toxic water, and I really do mean toxic when I say that. Um, but also it would be physically stable, so it wouldn't be uh, subject to significant erosion. Now, come back 15, 20 years later, because how long do we need to monitor these things for? The radioactivity of tailings from a site like a uranium mine will be radioactive, well, the half-life of uranium is 4.5 billion years. So 4.5 billion years from now, it will only be 50% radioactive as it is now. So if we think about that, it actually it's perpetually radioactive. We can't think of it in any other way. So we have to isolate that stuff forever. Forever into human history, into the future, whichever way humanity goes. Um, now if you come back 15 years later, and um, Bernd Lottemoser, I, I, not my work, often a lot of industry people like to think I make stuff up, but I don't. I ground truth stuff. I watch what's going on and I visit sites myself and I have been to Mary Kathleen myself. I, um, and Bernd Lottemoser's work with a master's student has shown that three of those four assumptions are wrong and significantly wrong. All right, so if you look at some photos, um, you can see the old open cut there. What you can also see is evidence of acid mine drainage and also just you know, stock or other animals walking straight through that. Right, so you can see the sort of some of the salt scars that are coming out. So clearly there is acid mine drainage there and you can see that in this photo and that's the sort of the classic sort of red that you get which is the sulphide or iron pyrite. And when that um, chemically reacts in the surface of course you get rust, iron hydroxide or oxyhydroxide. You also see the salts and so on coming out from there as well. That's a nice toxic soup. So there is acid mine drainage, there is greater seepage, and lo and behold, there is actually a risk to grazing cattle. And it's not me saying that, this is published in a nice, very respected international journal. So this study demonstrates that large scale invasion by a um, particular species, and Angus or others probably know more about those species than me, but it does pose a dietary risk to grazing animals. So 20 years ago, almost, almost 30 years ago now, um, that site was considered so good in its rehabilitation, it was given an excellence award, and yet 20 years later, we now know it's not good enough. Now, you can use Google Earth, and I, you know, I'm often one of these nerds who will sit down and use my iPhone. I do actually use my iPhone for some things, and zoom around and find old mine sites. It's amazing what you can see. And when you see this, you see an old open cut. This is just outside the LEB, um, the Calvert Hills, or sort of near the Barclay um, Tablelands, I guess, um, not far from Willagarang. Um, small copper mine opened in the 1990s, or there was some bit of you know, small scale artisanal mining before that, but a proper mine went in in the 1990s. You look at that, there's the tailings dam, it's water, um, and you look at that, it doesn't seem too bad. Until you actually go next door and actually visit the site for yourself. I have never seen a site so intensely polluting, and I don't say that lightly. To see the seepage going through the water table of pure acid mine drainage water, the likes of which is actually a commercially gr commercial grade copper solution, all right, going straight through the water table and going straight into the old open cut, just draining freely out there, and then this is Hanrahan's Creek, biologically dead. You know, and the TOs that um, that used to live on this area are sort of uh, not exactly very happy. All right, and of course, in the creek, you've already got basically you know battery acid conditions. Another one, of course, which is more recent and very current is the old Mount Morgan um, gold and copper mine. It operated for a lot longer. It wasn't just a couple of years in the 1990s like Red Bank, but it lasted for a long time. And you can see some numbers there, but it, if you can imagine 8 million ounces of gold, you know, the, the current gold price, you can probably start to get a sense of its importance. It was one of Australia's giant gold mines. Um, but the pollution of the Dee River has been going on for a century. Uh, and it was largely just ignored. You know, and I've found it quite bizarre in some ways that one of Australia's most polluted rivers um, has had virtually no attention. Now the Queensland government realised that when it shut down in 1990 um, that they did some works and they, uh, I'll at least give the Campbell Newman um, government um, credit for the fact that they haven't cut the budget back on the Mount uh, Morgan 
um, rehabilitation project yet, um, but it's still not good enough. It's like putting a Band-Aid over a uh, you know, bleeding artery. Right, so but there was some work's done and that's continuing, but it's not fixing the primary source of the problem, which is all the waste rock, all the tailings and so on. And of course, that's the old mine site. You can see the open cut. Now, it was only from about 160 million tonnes of mine waste. And 10 kilometres downstream in the Dee River, that's what it looks like. Extraordinarily polluted. And uh, it's when you look at the biodiversity indices in here, well, there aren't any you know, and stuff. So now, uh, normally that's fine. It's the Dee River and the locals just accept it. That's just been the cost of mining. They want to see the river fixed, but they know it's going to cost hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. All right, um, but at least the Queensland government cares and puts signs up. Of course, most recently, um, the pit overflowed. Basically, when they stopped mining and they turned off the, um, all the pumps in the, in the pit, of course, the water fills up. Not too hard to imagine hydrology. If you've got a bathtub, or a big pit, it'll fill with water and then overflow. And of course, that's what's happened this year. First time ever. And that's pushed the pollution much further down the Dee River than anyone's ever seen before. And it's seriously worrying people. Right, so now this is uh, just from the Asia, um, Australia Pacific, sorry, the uh, LNG project. Um, now when we're looking at these things, instead of going above ground with coal seam gas, of course, we've got to worry what's going on below ground. So we can see the sort of the coal seams down here. We might have a shale, maybe a sandstone, another sh maybe a clay layer, another sandstone. Um, you can see the sort of condomine system in the back here. So what we've got to try and picture is this three-dimensional structure of the geology, how groundwater interacts with that and then how the groundwater interacts in this sort of scenario or over here as well. All right. Not exactly that easy. All right. Now when you look at a site, a photo like this, and this is just from Appia in terms of a, a typical photo that's often used for coal seam gas, and fine, surface footprint, that's a hell of a lot smaller than Mount Morgan, but that's not the whole picture. The real issues, and this is where a lot of the controversy is, and I've looked at a lot of the primary data that the industry and others have put out there, um, we can't answer these questions yet about what really is going on in groundwater, what's really going on with a lot of the gaseous emissions, and it's not just methane, there's volatiles and so on as well. All right. Now, I talked a lot about this last year when I was up here for the, um, the Desert Channels Queensland and the Rapid uh, Coal Seam Gas Forum, so the links will be out there, but um, have a look there. Now, since then, of course, we've got the gas bubbling up in the condom mine. Now, I think it could be explained by what we're seeing with CSG. I don't say it is. I say it could be, because I don't know. Within an hour, of course, Queensland government and uh, the CSG industry were denying it could ever be related to CSG, which is interesting when they haven't even done any investigations yet. But what we're basically seeing here is you've got the balloon coal measures, so higher water pressure initially, and sort of the, say, the condomine water levels down here. And so that's been reversed. By taking out so much water for CSG, it's pushed the water levels down in the balloon, and of course now the water's going down. And so that's allowed this gas to start migrating up. I think that could be a viable explanation um, for what we're seeing in the condom mine, and perhaps other places as well. But I don't know, I wait to see the data, I know that's yet to come out yet. Now the other thing, just very quickly, and I'm almost finished, so is this shale oil discovery. Now one of the things for someone like me who watches the mining industry as close as I can given, you know, um, 24,000 hours in a day, um, major oil discovery in South Australia. Now it wasn't a discovery, it was an exploration target i.e. this is what they think could be there and what they're hoping will be there. It's not properly drilled, not properly assessed. Certainly if you're you know, a CSG company or a mining company, you have to give a pretty tight number and actually a good basis to say, yes, we've got this much oil or copper. All right. um, but it generated this sort of huge thing because Australia's short of oil. We're past peak oil in Australia and they're desperate. They're desperate to try and fill that gap. All right. And so when you see these sort of comparisons, people think, oh, well, we have to do it. And it's like, Hopefully never. Shale oil is a really dirty business. It's much more greenhouse intensive. Um, you've got to process the material and everything else. So um, hopefully, you know, um, this was just starting to come on the horizon when I was still on the GAB committee, which is some years ago now. But hopefully um, that's one that we can all sort of, uh, well, we can't ignore it, but hopefully it's one we won't have to fight too hard. But in that sense, while mining does provide some economic activity and, and things, and I haven't really talked about the social side of things, it's not really my area, but there's other issues there as well. Um, but it's that legacy of mine waste. One of the key messages that I think hopefully people will remember is the legacies will continue. Even if we do what we think is good rehabilitation now, it may not be good enough in 20 years or 50 years, especially when you're thinking about climate change. So in that sense, that's why I take a very precautionary approach 
um, and I look for a lot more evidence than often what's, what is used to, to assess projects. So uh, hopefully the LAB can learn from you know, other areas um, and make good choices and uh, keep the LAB sustainable. Thank you.